Good morning. Can every, good morning. Yeah, let's get some, some energy going, right? Um, so I'm Corey Thane. I am the Vice President uh, for Global Policy at Circle, uh, and I'm honored to be uh, here with all of you today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Circle is an internet native financial markets infrastructure company that connects traditional to decentralized finance, and that enables faster, cheaper, and programmable payments. So among other things, we are the issuer of USDC, which is the largest regulated stable coin in the world with more than $50 billion in circulation. I personally joined Circle because of its mission to raise global economic prosperity through the frictionless exchange of value. As someone who grew up in a blue collar family and who has also had the opportunity to visit some of the poorest countries in the world, the idea of creating more economic opportunity for more people, uh, particularly those uh, lower on the wealth spectrum, uh, was instantly appealing to me and it motivates my work every day. So for a minute, I would like you to imagine a world in which you can send money as easily as you can send an email. That is Circle's vision and that future is within our grasp. Circle enables payments that are borderless, that settle instantly, and that costs just a few pennies to send and receive. Now, USDC has numerous uses in crypto capital markets and DeFi protocols, um, but it's increasingly being used for its utility outside crypto markets. Among other things, USDC is being used in disaster relief, where the US government has used USDC to distribute relief funds to Venezuelan medical workers and other Venezuelan nationals in need of humanitarian aid. Remittances, where people who move to a foreign country in search of work can instantly send USDC to support their families back home, avoiding wait times of up to 10 days and charges of 10% uh, under traditional remittance companies. Payroll, where businesses can pay employees in more than 190 countries around the world and avoid the barriers imposed by traditional financial rails. And philanthropy, where donors big and small can donate USDC to more than a million and a half organizations, such as Partners in Health, National Public Radio, and the International Committee of the Red Cross. And to think that we are just getting started. Now today's discussion comes at a pivotal moment for the entire Web3 industry, the US, and the global economy. As we all know, public blockchains and digital assets are reshaping how the global financial system operates and creating possibilities that just a few years ago were unimaginable. Internet financial services represents a market opportunity similar in scale to that of internet commerce, communications, transportation, media, and entertainment. While today we are all well familiar with names like Amazon, Google, uh, Uber, and Meta, None of these companies existed 30 years ago. So let that sink in. Three of the 10 largest American companies by market cap were nothing more than ideas in their founders' minds, if that, in 1992. Just as retail, information, transportation, media, and entertainment were transformed by these American success stories, today's financial industry can be similarly transformed by digital access assets and blockchain technology. Notwithstanding this enormous potential, there are clearly challenges ahead. Digital asset markets have suffered through a brutal year. Two trillion dollars of value has been wiped away. Investors have incurred significant losses. There have been significant bankruptcies uh, with uh, investment companies. And we are in a risk off posture as the US suffers from the worst inflation in 40 years. This market disruption may have reached its apex when an algorithmic digital token that called itself a stable coin, but was more like, in my opinion, a synthetic derivative, imploded in a matter of a few short weeks, leaving a $50 billion hole in investors' pockets just months after the company put its name on the seats at Nationals Park. We've also seen extraordinary market conduct violations perpetrated by Hydra companies operating in a regulatory vacuum from undisclosed offshore locales. As just one example, weeks ago, 
common and exchange unilaterally swapped investors' holdings of USDC to a token issued by the exchange itself, a move that some have likened to switching investors from dollars to rubles without their knowledge or consent. These problems have arisen while, or perhaps because, the U.S. is suffering from a fintech constitutional crisis and regulatory Game of Thrones, in which Congress, ha Congress has not enacted any meaningful legislation, and regulators across agencies have jockeyed over the meaning of the term security, commodity, and the like. Internationally, the regulatory outlook appears to be developing at a pace that is more befitting to an industry moving at the speed of the internet. The European Union recently introduced the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation, a comprehensive whole of government approach. Countries like the UK and Singapore are actively considering what role digital assets can play in the economy. Perhaps more ominously, China has launched its own central bank digital currency, the ECNY, which has put programmable money into the hands of 260 million people to date, and with likely more to come. All this activity is evidence that despite the market's recent downturn, digital assets are here to stay. So we must ask ourselves, what is at stake? Well, firstly, as Sir John Cunliffe, Deputy Governor for Financial Stability at the Bank of England has pointed out, the companies that survive this crypto winter may turn into the Amazons and Googles of tomorrow. The country that those companies call home may very well depend on the planning, coordination, and regulation that leaders adopt and implement today. Consider for a moment how the United States harnessed the nation's creative talent to win the internet revolution. The U.S. established sensible guardrails and that then let innovators innovate, leading to an explosion of jobs and economic growth. This isn't to say that the government always struck the perfect balance or that it could not have addressed certain problems earlier than it did. But its approach, for the most part, provided fertile soil for technology to develop that made our daily lives easier, more productive, and democratized access to information. The movement of value through Web3 can lead to another explosion in productivity, opportunity, leisure, and American competitiveness. Let's stick with the case of payments, which are currently too slow, too expensive, too opaque, and too exclusive. Faster, cheaper, and programmable payments under standards that enshrine privacy and inclusivity as core values are good for consumers and businesses, and bad for rent collectors and autocrats. Put, your shoes, put yourself in the shoes of a day laborer or a gig economy worker who lives paycheck to paycheck. Streaming payments so that people in this situation are paid at the end of a day or a shift would make an enormous difference in the quality of their lives. It would free up valuable time otherwise spent waiting in line to cash a check. It could alleviate at least a little of the intense anxiety that comes with financial insecurity. And it would protect precious, hard-earned funds from predatory lenders. That time and money can be reinvested in family, community, education, health care, and a myriad of other goods and services that make people happier, nations stronger, and life better all around. So, I think we can agree that there's a lot at stake for countries and their citizens. With opportunity and responsibility in mind, let's turn now to our distinguished panelists for their wisdom and insights. So um, as we start here, maybe we could just do a, a quick round of introductions, uh, starting with you, Tom. Sure. Uh, Tom Quadman. I'm Executive Vice President with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And uh, in that role, I oversee three separate divisions of the chamber, the uh, Center for Capital Markets Competitiveness, 
the Global Innovation Policy uh, Center, which deals with IP policy, as well as our uh, Center, for Center for Technology Engagement. I think we go. We live now. Yes. So I'm Lawrence Wintermeyer. I am the chair of GBBC Digital Finance. GBBC Digital Finance is the financial services uh, vector of GBBC, and we focus on standards and, and education. Um, I'm also a GBBC board member. My name is Jude Ogeni, uh, and I am the founder and CEO of Charles Winsboro Corporation. Charles Winsborough works with partners with um, U.S. institutions to provide uh, future of work reskilling and upskilling opportunities to uh, Africa's working uh, professionals. Uh, separately, I'm also the deputy general counsel of a company called Paxful, which is a crypto peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Um, my name is Dina Ellis Rockhind, and um, I am in the fintech practice at Paul Hastings. I started there five and a half years ago, and. Um, most of my clients are in the crypto, blockchain, and fintech space. Um, I, do, I do government affairs work because I spent 15 plus years in the government. Um, but I also do a lot of, um, give a lot of strategic advice and advisory work. And um, aside from Paul Hastings, I am on, um, I'm on uh, um, GDF's or GBBC's advisory council, but I'm also an advisor to um, a number of different startups that are in the Web3 and crypto space. Excellent. Well, very, very excited to see you here today. Um, I thought maybe we could start with you, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you think at, is at stake uh, for Web3? Um, you know, the White House has issued an executive order, uh, and it seems like there's a flurry of bills uh, floating around the Capitol Hill now. So I'd be uh, interested to get your perspective on what's at stake for the United States uh, as it relates to the globally connected world. Sure. Um, no, Corey, thank you for the question. And I want to thank American University for hosting this conference. Let me, t let me take a 30,000 foot level um, view of it. So in 2021, after we put together a digital assets working group that was a cross section of the industry and various thinkers, whatever, we came out with a report um, that called for and had very specific suggestions around a regulatory structure around digital assets, right? So the chamber calling for regulation is not something you necessarily see every day, right? And we did that for a couple of different reasons. One is if you're going, obviously we have this evolving marketplace, right? And if you're going to have a, an efficient marketplace that has certainty that people are willing to engage in, you need to have rules of the road and you need to have appropriate oversight with that. Um, the second part of that is we've gotten into a very bad habit in this country where we have innovated and developed the technology, yet we're not willing to set the rules. So if you sort of look at data privacy as, as maybe the, the big, biggest example of that, obviously we've been in the tech lead and all that, the European Union right, was the first one out of the blocks was GDPR to create a data privacy network, right, which is why we're always, you know, accepting cookies, right? That is the global standard. Well, the implication of that is whoever sets the rules, that's where the activity is going to migrate towards, right? So if you look at it where we are, we have the UK looking at, um, you know, Web3, right? as that is how they're going to keep a relevant financial services sector post-Brexit, right? The European Union, uh, through Mike and, and others, uh, other initiatives, is looking to try and create global rules, as they did with GDPR. If you don't think that's the case, they're members of the UK government and they're you know, MEPs and members of the EU government that are coming to Silicon Valley on a regular basis. And they first stop in Washington, right? The third part of that is, is China, right? So China, remember, they're trying to build out a domestic payment system, right? So it's sort of like, you know, why did Africa skip landlines with telephones and go straight to cell phones? So if you don't have to build that infrastructure, right, you can just go to, you know, to the most technologically advanced infrastructure. That's where China's going. Part of what China is also looking to do 
is they're looking to displace the dollar as a reserve currency, and this is a pathway to doing that. Also by building out a separate in, uh, international payment system outside of SWIFT. So there's a big competitiveness issue um, in terms of that with vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. Some of the points that you raised, we have, you know, Treasury, the executive orders, we have Treasury coming out with the blueprint, which I think gives a pathway for coherent, for a coherent structure. It's going to take a long time to get there, understanding we have these other international actors out there. Uh, we have Congress where Congress is looking very closely at, you know, maybe some initial steps in terms of legislation. You know, Pat Toomey in the Senate has been uh, working on some of this. Maxine Waters and, and McHenry have been working on that. Um, I actually think there's an opportunity where you can have a strange bedfellows alliance after the midterm elections. This, it doesn't really matter what those outcomes are. We could have Democrats or Republicans come together, both in terms of Congress and the administration, maybe getting on the same page and starting to take those steps forward. So that's right where I think we are right now. Uh, thank you for that. So much, so much that I want to unpack from that. Um, you, you covered a, a broad spectrum of things that I'd like to um, go just a little bit deeper on. Um, Dana, given your uh, long history inside of the government um, in you know some really prominent institutions. I'm wondering if you have uh, anything to add to that. Um, in particular, I, I'm personally at Circle. I'm uh, closely monitoring um, the uh, McHenry and Waters bill uh, that we sort of created this portmanteau of the McWaters bill, right? <laughs> and then, um, uh, and then there's also the Digital Commodity Protection Act uh, working through the Senate, among uh, a number of other bills um, in like House Agriculture and other areas. Uh, do you have any specific question, uh, not questions, but specific thoughts about sort of where those bills are going, um, the things that we know about them today, like what's good, what's bad, how do they work together if we ended up you know, uh, getting them passed into law? Um, anyway, we'd, we'd just love to hear your thoughts there. Sure. So, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. So, um, so this is a big week for crypto, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here this week, and I want to thank GBBC and Sandra and um, Circle as well for inviting me. Um, this is a huge week. I mean, there's the merge, right? But then we also have um, two hearings in Congress this week at the same time on Thursday. One is the House Agriculture Committee um, on the, you know, the Stabenow Bozeman legislation, um, and the other is in Senate Banking, with um, SEC Chair Gensler, it's on, um, it's on oversight, uh, SEC oversight, but my guess is that there's some discussion about crypto and potentially stable coins as well. So I think that, um, I think that what is happening in the Agriculture Committee um, and with Stabenow in Bozeman is a significant and positive development for the crypto industry because you have the chair and ranking member um, of the Committee of Jurisdiction who has jurisdiction over um, the CSDC supporting it. And it's not always easy to get those key players to support something like that. Um, so I think that that language, some of that language um, that's in there um, will survive. I do think that, um, yeah, it would be nice to take some of the largest cryptocurrencies that already exist today. Lots of retail investors own them. They've almost become an asset class and kind of take them off the table, right? And say, okay, they're going to be commodities. I do think, um, I mean, this week, um, you know, the question is ETH, right? So we'll see how ETH plays out with the merge and if these hearings this week, this is really an ETH week. Um, in um, When it comes to... Um, so what I think on the digital commodity, on the, the, the ag bill, is that um, I think some of that will survive, right? Um, but I don't think that, um, I think the big thing also is that, um, you know, the House Financial Services and the Senate Banking Committees will not, um, and this, the Stabenow bill doesn't do this, they won't cede their jurisdiction um, to the ag committees. And that this is going to be the future of finance. So there's definitely going to be a component of this that comes out of the banking committees as well. 
and that gets into SEC and bank regulation and those types of things. On the stablecoin legislation, um, I think that there's, um, there's a positive to stablecoin legislation, and the positive is that you have both in the House, you have McHenry and Waters, or Waters and McHenry, chair and ranking member, both want to work on state, or both trying to work on a stable coin piece of legislation. And in the Senate, you have, um, is also bipartisan. So you have, um, you know, you have Brown and Toomey, uh, they're all on the same page yet. They will have to agree to whatever the stable coin bill looks like to pass the Senate. But they also want stable coin legislation. And it'll be interesting to see what they say this week on Thursday, if anything. So, um, so you have both houses on a bipartisan and bicameral basis who want to get this done. None though, and, and you have um, the administration, Treasury, um, the Fed, who also wants to get stablecoin legislation done. So everyone wants to get it done, but the devil's in the details, right? So um, the devil is in the details. And the question is, um, really, I mean, the biggest question is, does every stable coin, you know, aside from the reserves and things like that, should every stable coin be regulated like a bank, right? I personally think no. Others think, you know, I mean, others see this as um, maybe it's a power grab. But I mean, stable coins, you know, we're talking about there's some stable coins that are almost used like money market funds, but they don't have that same regulation. And Gensler mentioned that in his speech. He talked about money market funds, which might be a good answer. By the way, that product was created in the 70s, so you could theoretically, if Spencer's willing to, you could create a new product too that has certain requirements. And um, but a lot of um, the use cases with um, stable coins is, is payments that we we're just talking about. And so, you know, payments today, um, they, generally speaking, they are not regulated at the federal level. They have some regulation with FIFIAC, you know, like um, Mastercard, Visa, all those. But most of the regulation is at the state level. And so, you know, the question becomes with this legislation is, is the industry going to wind up being more regulated just for a new technology, a technology that's going to save people money, um, that's faster, cheaper? Um, and that is what I, you know, so I am concerned that we wind up with more regulation than we have under current law for similar activities that are on new technology. Um, whether these bills will pass, I mean, I know that this is the most like pressing issue and the most tangible one. Um, it's hard to say, you know, it's a matter of whether these members can come to some kind of agreement with the Treasury. And um, we don't know, you know, so it could happen. You know, Maxine Waters wants to do a hearing on the legislation when it's um, when it's done, um, when they get an agreement. But you got to have Toomey and Brown on board. So if nothing happens, my guess is um, we don't see. Well, the issue is that, you know, Michael Barr and the Fed and the, the regulators have said, if you don't pass legislation on stable coins, we're going to figure out it, it for ourselves. Um, and, you know, that could be. Um, it could be SIFI designation or something very onerous. So you want to get stablecoin legislation passed. Unlikely that I would say that if it doesn't get passed, my guess is nothing happens till after the elections. And then the question will be like, what does Congress look like? And um, depending on how it looked like, does something happen during lame duck, you know, re regulatory or legislative or regulatory? Anyway, it's, um, it's hard to say, but it is a positive that everyone wants to get something done on it. Um, I'll just close by saying on this that I just hope that whatever, they, my concern is this technology is constantly changing, right? So we have proof of work, proof of stake, there's gonna be something else, right? So whatever Congress passes, you don't want it to sort of um, talk too much about the technology because the technology change is gonna change rapidly. So you want it to be something that's gonna live um, and breathe Maybe the regulators can make tweaks, but you just you don't want something that's so um, stuck to the technology as it exists today. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. But I do think a lot of progress and um, the Stabenow Bozeman legislation. And you know, no, I work for two Michigan companies, and when Senator Stabenow puts her mind to something, I mean, she's really um, good about getting things done. 
Um, and um, obviously, CFTC, you know, Ross Benham is also, he's been working on these issues for a while, also thoughtful. So I see a lot of positive on that front. Thank you. We've got a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Principles based rather than prescriptive, right? Um, uh, when, when they create regs, uh, look into the future. Um, Lawrence, how about uh, Europe and you know, other developed economies around the world? How are they uh, competing uh, to sort of you know, win in the uh, Web3 space? Well, uh, that, that, that's a great question. I have to say um, thank you for your um, you know, insightful and, and sensitive narrative because I, I think not just your own narrative, but in the way you, you couched it, you'll probably be aligned with most people. In, in, in this room in, in the context of Web3. And then I was grateful to the first uh, panel for the definition of, of, of the metaverse. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're very rarely the arbiter of discretion on these things. We focus on standards. We, we, we actually have a community of everyone from the larger, vast stablecoin providers right through to FIs and, and advocate, advocate proportional regulation um, but, you know, the right size proportional regulation for this community so that we can deliver a utility point and scale it and make it meaningful to consumers and businesses, and, you know, take away some of the risk. Um, I'm actually a derivatives guy anyway. I like risk, but there's no place for it, you know, generally in the main retail market or, you know, in, in, in many spaces. And, and so just to this point on, on, on Web3 and regulation um, and, and reflecting on the first panel, your uh, narrative of, I want to be able to transfer value like an email, I think is the, the, the phrase I use. I love that. And then, you know, the idea that in Web3, different to Web1, which was text-based, we got email and discussion boards, or Web2, which is where the walled garden platform came from, and, you know, economic surveillance monetized all of us and sold our data without us knowing. Web3 needs to turn that on its head. And, and so I would agree with my esteemed colleague here about Europe and GDPR because Web3 is not going to work unless we get digital identity right and we get the next level of cyber built into, uh, you know, bro broadly protocol and pro cross-protocol engagement. So if you look at the cyber statistics right now, and any of you can quote them, uh, whether you're in the crypto world or just the digital world, uh, none of it's going to work unless we address this at a technical and infrastructural level. And I, I don't think we'd be advocating it's a safe pool for anyone because it's just a mess now. And it was never, you know, uh, the, the infrastructure we have was never developed for a Web3 vision, certainly as, as our esteemed colleagues in the previous panel uh, put it. So I think just to try to put together what does that mean from a regulatory perspective? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're here speaking with policymakers and regulators all week. And then, you know, I spend a lot of time with, um, you know, traditional public company you know, front FIs, you know, CEOs who say, can you just tell, tell us what this Web3 or metaverse thing is? Because we have no idea. I mean, we're, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to deal with some of the bits of, you know, crypto or digital asset re regulation and along with Web3. Well, what, what, what the hell is it and what does it mean? And, and, and so I, I think that's important because it gets back to your utility point of, look, I just want to transfer value like I do email. Um, and so all of the stuff around security and custody needs to work. But... You know, back to the specific regulation bit, I, I think the point on, on my colleague Nate on Mika, Mika has really at least delivered a comprehensive framework for retail consumer protection. And, and it's pretty simple because it says, well, actually, if you're a commodity or a security already, we, we have regulation for that, whether you're a crypto or digital or not. So you need to go down that track. But if you're not uh, an, an existing instrument, then we've got this thing called Mika, which very much focuses on stable coins or e-reference coins asset reference uh, tokens. And so I, I think those sort of uh, frameworks that will be legislated over the next couple of years bring meaning to particularly the token space, probably the payment token space. And as you've spoken about, the whole stablecoin ecosystem moving beyond just being a crypto on and off ramp and you know, providing utility in the payments infrastructure. So I, I would look at that as the first starting move as we try to sort out, you know, some of the utility around security and digital identity. But, you know, I'm delighted to have a G, G, GBBC a Digital Finance Board member, Greg Medcraft, with me. 
who's uh, former IOSCO chair, former Australian Securities chair, uh, former OECD Financial Services Directorate. And, and you, you know, we, we, we look at reg equivalents all of the time. And uh, I think what we would say right now, uh, although, you know, the, the narrative coming out of the U.S. is, you know, quite as it always is, is, like, hey, we're great at digital. We're the digital innovation hub of the world. But all of the regulation comes later, whether it's tax, you know, whether it really is anything to do around identity or provenance in social media, um, you know, whether now it's financial services. And I think what we would say is that, uh, particularly with the direction of travel and stable coins, uh, oversight of the spot markets, and then some delimiting of securities, there's actually a reasonable equivalence developing between the U.S. and Europe that we would see, and a great opportunity to harmonize some of this stuff. And I think if you come from the cap markets, you take that sort of approach, and we've got a lot of the tools to do it. We just need to get everyone in the room together, and, and we do. We need to get some of the folks who are really on the periphery of trying to arbitrage things, but say we're into inclusion and we're into technology to, to get in line, because nobody, nobody believes that. It's not a legitimate net narrative. And, and so if we get that, and then, you know, I know we were talking about lots of things that you, you and I wanted to talk about, even on CBDCs, but if we just put that into the context of global trade and we accept that, you know, on a, on a you know, 50 something trillion, you know, global trade budget, um, or 28 trillion, sorry, global trade, uh, you, you know, budget, it really is China, the European Union, which is 27 countries in the US that constitute the lion's share of that. Don't mean to be disrespectful to other people in the world, but those are the three are big, the, the big players. And China, in the context of this discussion of equivalence we're having, is out of commission. It's putting in its own swift replacement uh, system, which it's working you know, very, very much with, with the Russians right now in order to circumvent SWIFT. Um, it's focused on its own um, you, you know, centralized uh, CBDC, but particularly as a means for trade in the Belt and Road. So it would be good to even get Europe uh, and the US a bit, a, bit, a bit closer on this equivalence argument because I think we're right with stable coins in the payments area and the spot market, and, and it is a good start. So I'd be optimistic that hopefully over the next couple of years we can build those sort of bridges. And unfortunately, having spent my career working in China, I just think it'll be very difficult really for the next decade, um, and, and we need to pay attention to, to what goes on there. Yeah, th thanks for bringing up the uh, digital yuan, um, and maybe we can turn to that uh, in a little bit. But Jude, I wanted to ask you a little, that you do uh, a lot of work with Africa uh, and sort of connecting them to American universities, and you're also working with this peer-to-peer -peer, um, network. Um, given what Lawrence just said, you know, with these three sort of like major economic zones in the world who are all, maybe, maybe the uh, EU and the US are on a path to harmonization, and then China's kind of doing its own thing. And we know that China has, um, uh, an extraordinary amount of influence and investment in Africa. What are you seeing um, in developing economies um, with regard to Web3? And you know, how do we bring Africa and, and these other economies into um, uh, harmonization, potentially, um, with you know, EU, US? How do we, uh, maybe before we get to harmonization, how do we just get them uh, opportunity um, and participation in, in this revolution? So thank you very much for the question. And first, let me say thank you again to GBBC for this panel. It's um, very informative. Um, I feel like jumping back into the audience and just listening. <laughs> um, and again, thank you to American University. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm going to change the thrust of the question somewhat, um, if you don't mind, because frankly, I think that whether people know it or not, uh, Africa is forcing its way into the discussion. You don't need to ask them you know, to figure out how they're going to be part of it, because frankly, a lot of the growth, a lot of the energy in the crypto space is coming from the global south. It is coming from sub-Saharan Africa. It is coming from Latin America. It is coming from South Asia. And so, for example, I'm Nigerian. Uh, if you look at poll after poll, uh, Nigerians are the most crypto curious uh, people on the face of this planet. Now, what is driving that? I, I got to be honest. Some of that is, yeah, you know, 
you've been hit up, all of you, by this email from Nigerian Prince, right? So, there, <laughs> there, there, so, so there's some of that going on, no, no question about it. But what I, I think people don't re really realize is that the, your prototypical um, crypto customer in Nigeria or in Sub-Saharan Africa is not the guy who's on Yahoo trying to you know, do a social engineering scam on you. It is the lady in the market who is selling tomatoes. And she has just sold her tomatoes and she's gotten the Naira in exchange. Uh, but she knows that the value of that Naira is depreciating every day that she holds it. And so she wants to flip it as quickly as possible into Bitcoin or a stable coin, right? That is what is driving this. And so from my perspective, I'm glad that Tom used the analogy of uh, of leapfrogging from you know analog telephony to mobile telephony because that's exactly what we did in sub-saharan africa i think we have the opportunity to do that in again in sub-saharan africa as i've argued in the regulatory environment and what do i mean by that i think that a lot of these efforts that we've just been discussing with respect to um, regulating in this space are um, efforts to undo you know, the fact that we've driven into a ditch uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Let me give you a specific example. The Howey test and the definition of what is or is not a security in terms of what is an investment contract. That is just something over which the SEC and CFTC are fighting, you know, viciously. Kind of takes you back to, you said you come out of the derivatives world, the jurisdiction with respect to derivatives and the Shad Johnson Accord and all of that stuff, right? So um, these things come up uh, because it's a vestige of the Howey test and other things. Well, we don't have a Howey test in Nigerian securities regulation. Um, notwithstanding the fact that the SEC says that cryptos are securities and should be regulated as such, when you actually you know, sort of pin them down, they will agree with you that there's no there there because there is no definition in the Nigerian securities regulation of an investment contract. And so my argument to them all along has been stop, don't go any further. You know, in the US, they're actually trying to undo some of that harm. So why get into it in the first place? Just leapfrog it into a much more nimble, much more, <clears throat> much more sophisticated, frankly, regulatory system that does some things around anti-fraud protections, but otherwise doesn't try to define with, you know, the kind of precision one can never attain what this is and what this isn't. Um, and so I think we have the opportunity to do that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, these, the governments in sub-Saharan Africa have not seen fit to do so. I mean, they're moving in fits and starts, right? So the Nigerian SEC just came out with a regulatory system for virtual assets. Great. It, I looked at it. It looks okay. Um, it's a promising start. Uh, but on the other hand, you've got the Central Bank of Nigeria, which has basically said to financial institutions, if your customers use bank accounts to facilitate cryptocurrency transactions, you've got to shut that down, right? Now, in a weird way, that works for me in the hat of peer-to-peer you know, -peer because that is exactly what drove peer-to-peer -peer adoption in Nigeria. When... You know, you, you cannot, the regulators in Nigeria, regulators generally have a hard time keeping up with fast, you know, moving developments in the market. It's all the more the case in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, these youth, in, 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 they're just digital natives. They will outstrip, you know, like in nanoseconds, any kind of regulatory, you know, uh, 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 you know um, blockades you try to put in their way. So from that perspective, it's been good, but I would love to see much more um, sort of cohesion, and I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit about, maybe I'll just, I'll just say it now. Um, it, it is in everybody's interest, I think, including, quote unquote, developed countries, for developing countries to move post haste to regulatory uh, clarity in this area so as to spur even greater adoption and uptake. Why do I say that? Because in, uh, again, I'll use Nigeria as an example. Nigeria, in, the, in, in, in Nigeria, the youth's favorite word is something called Japa, J-A-P-A. 
If you haven't heard that term, you should Google it. But what it essentially means is it's a Yoruba word meaning to flee. Every young person in Nigeria who has the wherewithal is leaving the country. They're going to Europe or they're going to the US or they're going to Canada. Uh, and uh, you're looking at a situation in which by 2050, Nigeria is going to be the third most populous country in the world, right? So that means that if you're hollowing out, you know, promising minds, uh, you know, people are just departing, becoming economic refugees elsewhere. First, it's putting a lot of burden on the developed countries themselves. And we're already starting to see that friction, not just at the margin, but it's becoming, and it's going to get worse. But what it means is that the, the countries that these people are leaving from, these promising young minds, just go deeper and deeper into this vicious cycle of despair, right? And so where, where this is now me putting on my Charles Winsboro hat, what I'm trying to do is, you know, upskill and reskill these folks so they can actually stay and take advantage of remote work opportunities where they can earn in crypto, uh, earn in foreign exchange, earn in stable coins. But they don't have to leave the way that I had to, you know, 30 years ago. And so I think there's a lot that um, needs to be done from a regulatory perspective, from a societal perspective, to make sure that we are creating the enabling environment for what these kids are already doing, which is transacting crypto. That's fascinating. Um, I have a couple questions after that, but one of them is, you know, if America led with, uh, you know, comprehensive regulation or at least something that covered 75, 80% of the market, would that help uh, harmonize with Europe and then uh, harmonize with, you know, the regulatory issues that you were talking about um, in Africa? And I guess a sort of micro follow-up to that is, does that woman selling tomatoes who wants to flip uh, the local currency into Bitcoin or a digital dollar, um, does she want a digital dollar or is it like, uh, open season, like she would take a digital yuan as well? It's, it's a great question. I, 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 having talked to you know, folks there, I think um, digital currency, uh, digital one is better than the Naira, right? But I think there is still a case to be made for, you know, all else equal, I'd go for the digital dollar, right? So I think that's where they are uh, leaning. But, 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 you know, there's also a huge appetite. You know, Nigerians are very entrepreneurial risk takers. That there's also a huge appetite for something that maybe isn't, uh, you know, I, I can see the volatility, but I, you know, I'd rather take, you know, my chances with, with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, is exceedingly popular there. But if the choice is between the digital one and, and, and the digital dollar, at least as of right now, um, the answer is the digital dollar. Understand that. You know, China has been doing a lot of investment in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It hasn't always worked out. Uh, there have been some significant downsides. I mean, you know, when you're doing stuff like financing the construction of the OAU building, the Organization for the African Union, and, if, and they find out that, you know, you planted bugs all over the place, it's not, doesn't sort of redound to your benefit, you know, uh, there. So there's a lot of a backlash. Um, and some other things going on at the margin. But to answer the first question, yes, if we had harmonization between the U.S. and Europe, 75 80 percent, I do think that that would go a long way. Again, my only caution is to these African countries is that in some ways what we are doing is a retrenchment from what, from some of the old things that we tried to do that didn't work out here in the U.S. And I don't think African countries should blindly follow U.S. regulation into the blind alley and then sort of back out. Just don't go in in the first place. Um, I fear we're starting to run short on time already. Um, I think we could keep going for hours with uh, the four of you. Um, this is for anybody on the panel. but. What's something that more people should be talking about with regard to Web3 uh, that we're just not? Um, you, you know, blind spots or just 
you know, issues that might emerge in the next year, five years, um, that you know, there's just not a lot of discussion about right now. Let me, I'll, I'll add something, and it really, um, when it comes to Web3 and portable digital identity and, you know, obviously the financial services, digital asset side of things, I think that there is um, a real opportunity here. Um, I really liked what you had to say in your speech, especially when you talked about the tech companies and how they've grown. But if you look at what's going on um, in terms of Capitol Hill, there is, and I'm not saying I agree with it necessarily, maybe I agree with some of it, but there is um, a fatigue with big tech. And there still remains, I don't have any problem with banks, but there still is fatigue with some of the larger banks, right? So then you look at sort of what's you know coming out from um, the discussion, right? So in tech, it's a lot about antitrust, um, privacy, right? The banks, you know, it's all sorts of whatever, um, CFPB, different types of new regulation, things like that. So to me, the thing that's very important about Web3 and that is not talked about as much as it should be is it, is it really gets rid of some of those issues. So when it comes to privacy, if you have portable digital identity, that solves for privacy, right? Because now you don't have to put your ID out there. You can just confirm it with your phone or whatever we're using in the future. When it comes to antitrust, I'm not a big believer in the US actively breaking up companies. I'd rather competition break up, right? Like there be competition. So again, like Web3 and digital ID, as well as, um, you know, the payments that can be done with crypto and things like that, that is all disruptive of the status quo and increases competition. I think that should be talked about more. I also think that um, in terms of, you know, we're talking a lot about digital assets and the financial services space when it comes to digital assets and crypto. Um, that's all, you know, that's important. It's probably the future of finance. It's, we are different in that we have a alphabet soup of regulators and we have functional regulation. And probably these regulators, they wanna, people like kind of know their area, they wanna sing off their own song sheets, so they'd rather you amend the securities laws or things like that versus like having a special treatment. Um, but um, I'm trying to think where I was going with that. So um, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, here's what I was gonna say. So that's all fine and good. That need, that's gonna be worked out, right? But what I am seeing that is just fascinating, and you know, at the last panel talked about meta and who's gonna control the metaverse and this, I mean, the race is on, right? The race is on, who's gonna control that? Is it gonna be that I can decide what I, which, how I wanna be advertised to or paid for watching something or, and so the faster that we can get through this financial services part where there's a lot of money right now, the more focus there can be on what Web3 is going to do for us as individuals. And I will say that as someone who has startups and things like that that I represent, I am seeing some really incredible things and probably things that um, I can't ima even imagine. Um, things like feeling like you're inside of music, right? And um, you can make your friends there and you feel like you're with your friends from all over the place. Um, or um, I'm just seeing incredible things. I think of my, um, one of the things that I think is really cool is um, working with a company that's you know, in the gaming space. And they were like, well, we work with food suppliers. And I'm thinking like, what does food have to do with gaming? But a lot of times if you're a gamer, you don't wanna get off your game, right? And so, I mean, you can't really eat virtual food, but you go to a food court on the metaverse, you order your food, it comes physically, it's not the same, you know, virtual food is not gonna work. And then like, you're actually sitting there. I mean, maybe it will be good for weight loss, but then you're like all sitting there and um, you're sitting there with your friends, right? So that makes me think of my, I have a daughter. She's gonna sound like she's from the geek squad. She does national debate, okay? So in the summer, she went to camp. She met all these people and they are in a, pr a group together where they do geeky stuff every Saturday night at eight o'clock. Not all my kids are like that, but anyway, so they are on Zoom. But what if it was like they um, felt like they were together in the same place, right? Eating together, going to a concert together, all those things, right? So, I mean, I think that, I mean, the internet still like amazes me. What the things that I would never think of, right? So you can see that we're, we're turning that corner. And I think that 
Yes, the money's in the financial services space, which is my, what I, I'm passionate about, financial services, but we need to talk more about these other parts. Because as I said, right now, we're, we're, hearing, about, we're hearing about antitrust over and over and over, and privacy, and you're like, okay, the answer is, the answer is not crack down on another industry, the answer is to let this industry disrupt. So, sorry for my impact. Uh, excellent, excellent. So, good to spend time with friends in the meta, bad to try to eat a meta steak. <laughs> Which meta is it, you know? Is it? <laughs> so, uh, Tom or Lawrence, any, any thoughts on this? Just a, a couple, uh, three quick thoughts. One is, I do think we can get to some sort of um, legal and regulatory structure, right? I think it's a matter of the will being there. I do think that there are ways to harmonize MICA with, with things here. I, I also think it's very important for Congress to act here, particularly in the light of the West Virginia EPA case that came out of the Supreme Court last June, uh, which this could, you could argue this is a major questions doctrine. Um, two other quick points. One is, um, sort of picking up on, on some of what Jude talked about, the, the part of the business community that is most crypto curious, black businesses in the United States, right? For some of the very same reasons, because we, we had stood up a DEI program at the chamber before COVID. We've been doing a lot of work in terms of minority access to capital. Well, what you've, the traditional problem for black businesses, right, has been trying to crack into the banking system. You're seeing the same leapfrogging going on, right, of, well, if you can't have access to the banking system, go to the technological advance that, that gets you access to capital and payment systems. So there's that. The last point I would just raise and just sort of throw a completely different uh, ball into the, into the mix there, because I do think, you know, when we talk about Web3, we are just really, we're where the internet was in 93 and 94, right? Think about the underlying technology in terms of DLT, blockchain, et cetera. Well, if you take a look at our corporate disclosure system, you take a look at our audited financial statements, whatever, that's a 1930s snapshot in time, paper-based system. You really want to start to revolutionize disclosures? That's the way to go. And you can have a much more close to real-time market, you know, market moving set of information. So it's really something to think about there too. Yeah. So Tom, I just want to say, so Tom and I worked on the Jobs Act, which oh, made yeah. changes to um, raising capital and the public and the private markets, right? So you, we realized, um, we scratched the surface. We did a great job. Tom was in my office every day, pretty much. We were working on it together. But the reality is what Tom is talking about is um, really it's, um, you're talking about changes to the securities laws that are still rooted in the Depression era. They don't, I mean, banking laws have been updated, but the securities laws are still behind. So I was so excited when the Jobs Act came out, and then I, when the SEC came out with the rules around crowdfunding. That's a whole like, discussion on that. <laughs> that's a whole discussion. That's like too many cooks in the kitchen. We can have a whole long discussion about why, but the statute is very prescriptive. So the SEC didn't have a lot of leeway in terms of, um, you know, Reg CF. Yeah. I, 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 and I'll try to be very brief. I know we need to wrap up, but, um, you, you know, and, and I have a lot of empathy with Jude's point because uh, we're, we're in the standard space. We're trying to set standards for all of this. It bores my wife to death, but... <laughs> I tell her that it's actually economically and anthropologically important. And in this case, we're trying to put standards around digital, uh, and digital and technology moves faster now than social anthropology laws or anything. So we all need to really pay attention here. And I think in the context of uh, you know, policymakers, we live in a democracy with common law in most of the you know, G20 countries, code law, which is where the Pareto bulk of GDP or trade is, or where we have incentives to get, in this instance, consumer protection right. So I think, you know, I actually think Jude is magnanimous because my own view is on some of the things we've spoken about today, we have a better opportunity to say, what benefit is all of this technology? I mean, if we could just ask that together with regulators, 
and, and, and you know, at least agree on a, de a degree of social utility and, and say, you know, we've got laws for most of this, but some of them do need to be updated a bit. If we could get through that process in a bit more of an orderly way, rather than a cat, mouse, arb, we'll sue you. You know, and you know, again, I don't know. I said this is probably a European view of, of a U.S. Uh, uh, you know, reg, uh, you know, problem that we see now in things like crypto, particularly right from utility tokens right now to anything that's a security. But I, I think this is really important to think about because, uh, again. We're so focused on equivalence that, you know, if, if you go ahead and decide to regulate any of the things that Dean and Tom are talking about here in crypto, but you don't get it right, you're going to get armed anyway. Yeah. And, and everyone's always talking about, you know, the, the, the consume, you know, our community is consumed with licensing. So Malta is probably the, the biggest, largest jurisdiction that's licensed VASPs, CASPs. VARA's popped up now in Dubai, I'm known to do the DFS and looks like it's trying to attack things. And, and you know, don't really Greg and I say, that's picks and shovels. Where are the assets? Um, who benefits from the assets? Where's the custody going to happen? You know, you get back to those questions, whether or not they're digital assets, crypto assets, or real world assets. And I only say that to the extent that I think we do need some leadership here and some cooperation to avoid uh, another generation of arbitrage, which our kids will be doing now on Roblox or uh, you know, Fortnite. They'll be arbing us while they're or ordering their <laughs> physical food through through a virtual community. And and just to pick up on one, one one other you know thing, in addition to sort of Mika, the work that's going on here and identity, which again I think is critical. I think Jude raises an excellent excellent point about his diaspora um, discussion. And then we didn't get to CBDCs. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, put put aside the yuan, but if you ever had a use case for a retail CBDC alongside all of our very strong private market stable coin issuers. It is in sub-Sahara Africa because our whole orientation towards securities or consumer protection in Europe are completely irrelevant in many places in sub-Sahara sub Africa other than some of the benefits that we're trying to achieve. So I mean, I'm going to have to say, because we're talking about central bank digital currency, and I'm probably going to sound like Randy Quarles or Pat Toomey because I used to work for Pat Toomey. But the strength, so this is all about the, you know, for the U.S. is the strength of the dollar, right? The strength of the dollar is because we have um, people trust us. We have a good legal system. I'm a lawyer. Maybe we're too litigious, but we have a good legal system, right? Um, and but it's also that we have the most robust private sector in the world. People, when they're using paying for things. I know there are some exceptions in Australia, so there are you know exceptions here and there. But generally, they're using our global brands, right? So, um, to me, central bank digital currency can mean different things, right? So I would interpret it in the narrowest of forms, right? Which is okay to the extent that the Fed runs payment systems like ACH today, run it on the blockchain instead, right? Um, but when it comes to payments that exist now. Again, like the private sector is constantly innovating and, um, and changing faster than the government can change. Look at Fed now, it's like Fed later, right? So our strength is going to be um, the private sector involvement. Um, and hopefully that private sector involvement is disruptive, right? Because right now we don't have a lot of competition in the rail space, right? The fees are generally interchange fees and um, you know, having new actors in the payment state space is going to strengthen the dollar. Um, I will also say just in terms of, you know, yes, the US, um, you know, now we've come to a point where we really need like everything nailed down, right? But the US, I think we're slower to move. Um, sometimes we're slow to move and it's bad, like five, you know, like, uh, what is it, 5G and Huawei and all that. Sometimes we're behind and that's a mistake, right? But sometimes I think we're slower to move because of the fact that we have that large private sector that's talking to everyone in Washington and the agencies, right? Um, and that um, we try to let a thousand flowers bloom and see where it goes, right? See where it, we don't want to like stifle competition and pick winners and losers too soon. Now we're at a point where the, the genie is out of the bottle, right? And now it's like the crypto industry is kind of almost a mirror of the financial services industry. Um, and, you know, feeling a lot of uncertainty, right? And so now we do need that certainty. Um, and I think retail investors need the certainty. 
Um, but that's why we're different um, in terms of how we move. We don't hold hands as fast with everyone that, um, because we don't want to do something that is going to be disruptive of innovation. And I'll just say one more thing. You know, I'm a Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, East Coast person. So I used to go to California all the time to speak, you know, when I joined my firm. The first couple times I went, I thought, well, about on crypto, I was like, this all sounds illegal. And there were like famous people talking about it. I'm like, this sounds like not right, right? And then I came to appreciate it. I was just like, you know what? If there wasn't that innovation out there, then we wouldn't be on, we wouldn't have Uber, right? Where we wouldn't have a lot of things that we have today. So it's by design that Silicon Valley is far from the East Coast so that they can like make things happen, like miraculous things, right? So, um, I mean, some of this is, um, as I said, it's like the way that we operate here in terms of, you know, having um, really relying greatly on the private sector. Great, great words to live by, I think. Um, uh, so thank you all. This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I think that we probably have some hungry people in the room here, um, but you have all given us a lot to think about. and. Uh, would love to uh, continue this discussion, get a little deeper into CBDCs and so on uh, at the next one. So um, thank you all and uh, appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, Corey. Thank you.